Hello everybody, welcome to video number three in the vintage Cape Cod making series. In the last video, I left off talking about the fabric and that I have been driving myself crazy because I was terrified of basically using that fabric and messing it up. And then I decided that I wasn't going to be like fully, you know, into the fabric until I actually started making the Cape Cod. But let me tell you that that was many months ago and in the months since I have been driving myself crazier over the fabric and in the end I decided not to use that blue fabric because two reasons. Uh, one is that it was actually very thick. Well, both of the reasons have to do with the thickness of the fabric. So the fabric is very thick and the pattern that I'm using, uh, this uh, Ann Adams pattern, does not account for the turn of the cloth. And it didn't come to me that that would be a problem until after I recorded the last video. So I did some testing and in fact, because the fabric is so thick, the turn of the cloth is a problem. So normally when you have patterns that are drafted for thicker wools or maybe for tailoring, the under collar, for example, which was one of the, my biggest concerns, would be different to the collar pieces, but that is not the case here. They're all the same, and the same thing with the facing. So I was very concerned that the fabric would just be too thick and the things just wouldn't look nice. So that was one. The second problem that I realized would be a problem was that because the fabric is so heavy and the coat and the cape together have something like four and a half yards of this thing, of this fabric, the, the cape would just be too heavy. Like the actual physical garment would be too heavy for me to wear. It would be too heavy for the, the coat to hold the cape. And basically I looked for months for a replacement and I couldn't find anything that I liked. And then in the end, I decided that I had to use what I had. So I went back to the fabric that I had bought at Mood. It is very thin for wool, but for the K part, I thought that it would be a good weight. I'm not crazy, crazy about the color, but I had been putting this thing off for months, literally months. So I just got to working. But because the wool was so thin, I needed something to give it a little more body, especially for the front. So in order to make my coat fold nicer and drape nicer, I decided to line the, the to flatline, interline. I'm using them uh, interchangeably, but you know they actually have different meanings. So I decided to flatline the front of the coat with white cotton flannel. So what I did was I cut my front from the wool, I cut the front again from the flannel and I lay the flannel on the wrong side of the wool and I have been treating them as one. So what's gonna happen with the flat lining is that the front of the coat is gonna be heftier than it would have been without the, the uh, flannel and it's gonna hang nicer and it's going to be a little bit warmer but most of it I was doing for the look because even though for the cape, the wool is a good thickness for the coat, I thought was a little too thin. But even though I decided to flatline slash interline uh, this front of the, of the coat, there were still some steps that I needed to follow from the pattern before I could do that. The pattern calls for the center front and the collar uh, bits, not the collar, but the, um, lapel bits of the fronts to be interfaced and I didn't want the interfacing to go on the uh, on the interlining on the flannel I wanted it to go on the actual wool so I fused the interfacing which I'm using uh, pro weft medium I fused that to the wool and then I flatlined the wool with the flannel in the rest of this video, I filmed as I went along in the process. So now that I have the front of the coat part of the cape coat lined or flat lined with the flannel to give some heft to the wool, it's time to think about how I am going to add some support to the shoulder slash upper body part of the 
coat that is going to support the cape stitching and I thought about a lot of ways how to do that um, first I thought that I would just well, like when sewing the cape to the coat I would put a um, like like twill tape on the underside so the, the on the flat line part uh, to give it some support but I don't think that's gonna work this is where the uh, the cable will be stitched on the right side so after thinking about this a lot I decided that what I'm gonna do is I am going to take uh, some hair canvas and I am going to cut two pieces that will be shaped sort of like this to give that area some support uh, and I will take away the seam allowances on the canvas so that they're not super bulky um, on the actual coat so it'll be like something like this and then around just to give it enough support here because my main concern isn't so much uh, to give support to like in tailoring this would be all canvassed but I want to make sure that when I sew the cape to the coat that the wool is not going to will droop I guess stretch but also that it's not going to tear with the weight of the wool that even though it's not that heavy I think it's still heavy enough to need some support so I yeah I think that's that's the best way forward and at the same time it will give me a little bit of shaping on sort of this part of the body which is kind of traditional in coats. I don't, I'm like, this is a wrap coat, uh, which is very fluid drapey anyway. So like, I'm not looking for a stiff tailored look, but I do absolutely feel like that cape needs to support um, on, the, on the coat side, just for safety. Okay, so here is what the canvas pieces look like and I hope you can see here I have cut them with pinked edges and that is just to make sure that they don't show up as a sort of a hard edge on the outside of the coat um, yeah so no hard edges okay so this is the right placement for this side as you can see um, all of the original stitching line that I marked is covered except like maybe like the very beginning but I wanted to again make sure that when I um, do the seams that this is not caught in a seam allowance so this will be fine now what I'm gonna do is just like roughly secure it so that it doesn't go anywhere and then I'm going to use the herringbone stitch to secure the canvas to the interlining so the white flannel all the way around and what I'm trying to do here of course is to make sure that I catch the canvas and then on the other side just the interlining I don't want this stitch to go through to my main fabric because I don't want it to show so I'm just going to do this all the way around and um, I'm not a very quick hand sewer, so it's going to take a while, but you get the idea. I don't know if you can see this stitch there, but that is what it's going to look like when I'm done. Before I go ahead and sew the darts on the front of the, of the coat, I am going to go ahead and do the pockets. Now, initially I thought that I would be doing inseam pockets, but I changed my mind. Um, I don't know why I changed my mind, but I did. <laughs> and uh, I have cut out the pockets from the fabric of the coat. And for the lining of the pockets, I didn't want to use something that would be uh, like flimsy and too difficult to work with because I want the pockets to look as sharp as they can. So what I've got in here is just some cotton that I had in my stash for like years I've made things with this if you look on my other videos you can probably see it so this is obviously not going to show 
but it is very stable and so it's gonna make the process of sewing the pocket and shaping the pocket a lot easier than with like silk or something along those lines or lining fabric so I don't know how these pockets are constructed so I'm gonna go ahead and follow the instructions on the pattern hit the first uh, snag basically the instructions for the pocket on the pattern is wrong and where to cut the lining for the pocket on the pattern pieces is also wrong so i have just spent probably 45 minutes or so trying to figure out how to sew the pocket because the written instructions and the um first of all, the written instructions are not very clear and then the diagram and the, and the written instructions cannot both be accurate because they're contradicting and I got it right in the end but basically what I had to do was just like by sheer force try it by um, by basting and turning and basting and turning until it came out right but I do have a pocket so now I will make the other one and then I will baste them to the jacket and see what it actually looks like another day some more work on this thing so last night I um, put the pockets on the front of the coat and <clears throat> I think there might be some trouble with that but I will talk about that later once I get to the stage where I've basted the you both the front and the back of the coat together and see how that goes so today i'm gonna start with the darts so i sew the darts last night through both layers of fabric so the safe uh, the, the self coat fabric and then the interlining what i'm gonna do now is i am going to trim the darts because they are very thick normally you would just press them down but what I'm gonna do, uh, based on some reading I've done on some of my tailoring books, uh, is trim them. So I'm gonna take some pink in shears and I'm gonna trim the darts to I guess about there or so. And then I'm gonna press them, but instead of pressing them down, I'm going to press them flat. So this is not gonna do it now because it's stuck together, but then it'll go something like this. And then of course I'll have to trim them. Um, at this end over here, but that is what I'm gonna do with those darts. I will talk about darts in the back now too, just because they're very simple and I won't probably talk about them as I'm doing them, but the back neckline for the coat part also has little darts. But I'm going to, I'm going to treat the back a little differently than I did the front, so I won't trim those darts. Um, I don't think I'll just press them, but these ones, they do need to be trimmed. And that is what the dart looks like after I trimmed it. I know I said that I would use uh, pink and shears, but in the end I decided not to use the pink and shears because it would just make it very messy down here. And this is not ever going to be washed in the washing machine anyway, so it's not going to fray. So now I'm going to sit down and I'm going to uh, stitch the dart, so both layers of the dart, to the interlining just to hold it flat. This is what the dart looks like when it's finished both sides have been uh, secured and then on the other side there are no stitches at all and I want to make sure <laughs> to say that all of these techniques I'm using here are based on things I've tried in the past and things I've read about in tailoring books I'm not saying that they are you know like Savile Row type techniques or that I'm an expert <clears throat> or anything like that. This is how I do it, this is how it works out for me. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to put that disclaimer in there. Now I finished the front as much as I can before putting it together with the back. And I spent a lot of time talking about the front because that's where I've done 
uh, the most and so it, it is it is a more complicated not complicated but it is a more involved part of the uh, code part of the Cape code is where I've done things the most differently <laughs> from the pattern and so I wanted to walk you through that now the back is actually very simple and so simple in fact that I haven't filmed any of the process but basically I sewed the back as the pattern instructed and unlike the front I'm not flat lining it so this is just the wool and I sewed the interfacing on the wool just as the pattern suggested but even though I wasn't interlining it with flannel like the front I still wanted to add some support so I have cut something called a back stay and it's essentially the shape of the back but only to about three inches or so below the arm side and this I am going to attach to the back just as I did the interlining to the front but here it will just hang loose and this will stabilize the neck it will give it uh, a little bit more structure than just the wool this is muslin and I've steamed it to shrink it a little bit but it is I don't know if you can see that like there is no drape it's pretty stiff and that is just what I wanted and the reason that I didn't flat line the back the way that I did the front well there are two reasons the first one is because the flannel adds a lot of bulk and I didn't want to have all that bulk on the neckline because there's already going to be a lot of seam allowances there because there's the collar, there's the facings, there's all of that. And also because the back of the coat will always be hidden by the cape so it's not going to ever be seen so if it was a little drapier than the front that's fine it doesn't matter and also the flannel does add some warmth but in the back again there'll be two layers of wool because there'll be the cape and the coat and so i won't need it for that so once i attach this i'm just going to baste it like i did with the flannel on the front uh, I will start putting the front and the back together of the shoulders with a permanent stitch and then I will um, base them at the side seams for my actual first try on and it's going to be very exciting because I have a lot of things I need to check when I, t uh, when I put that on and, and test the fit. Here I'm just sewing my shoulder seams and then I'm going to gray them by trimming the muslin and the flannel from the seam allowances and then I am going to secure the seam allowances to the body of the coat by doing a herringbone slash catch stitch all the way around. So the shoulder seams are done and I basted the side seams together just for fitting and I love how it looks so far. Now remember that this is a wrap coat so there is no front closure but I just wanted to well, first of all, test, fit, test whether I needed to make it tighter up here, and I don't. And also, um, I wanted to see what the level of the pockets was once everything was put together. Because when I put it on, put the pockets on, and just sort of lay the front piece on top of me, I felt that they were too low. But, you know, once you wrap it up and you put the belt on which i obviously have made yet but i will the pockets will be fine one thing about the pockets i spent all the time yesterday trying to figure out how to construct them and then i put them on and let me tell you that they are useless so these pockets the way that they are slanted and placed means that anything you put in them will fall out except for your hands so they are hand pockets, they're not actually pockets to put anything in. So if you put anything in here, it will just fall out. Uh, I guess people in the 1970s didn't actually need to put anything in their pockets. So yes, this is what it looks like right now. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to sew the side seams properly, press them, and that will be it for this stage of building the cape coat. So that is all for this installment of the cape coat making series. In the next video, I am going to make the cape. So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.